Hello and welcome back to another episode of Activist. I'm Gareth. And I'm Jackie. Imagine influencing a whole island to become vegan friendly. This is just what today's speaker, Meredith Marie, managed to achieve. Meredith is a shining example of how important hospitality activism is and how you can make a difference with every single meal. If you enjoy this episode, subscribe to our YouTube channel, leave a like on that video, leave a comment below if you learn something. We really hope you enjoy this and learn as much about it as we did. Enjoy. So thank you so much for joining us today, Meredith. Um, for our viewers out there who may not have um, heard of you before, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Meredith Marine, and I'm a vegan activist. I'm a social worker, and I'm an entrepreneur, and I run the company called Vegan Hospitality. And my mission and my company's mission is to make veganism accessible and acceptable throughout the world. Awesome. And you've been doing such a fantastic job of that. So we really look forward to talking to you about that. Um, for me, it was a real surprise, well, both of us, to, to learn uh, when, you know, researching a little about you that you were actually born and raised in a family of butchers. Um, but even then, despite it all, um, you know, you, you still weren't a huge fan of eating meat. And um, it really made me chuckle <laughs> to, uh, to hear the reason that you didn't eat lamb was because of the character Lamb Chop. Um, because when I was little, um, I used to watch that as well. And that was the exact reason I would not eat lamb either. So I, it's something I have done my whole life. So I was like, yes, somebody else didn't eat lamb because of Lamb Chop. <laughs> um, and I was just a toddler, you know, even at that young age, I made a connection too. But um, it was actually a really different connection a bit later on that uh, made you decide to stop eating meat though altogether, wasn't it? Would you mind sharing that story? Because it's quite special. Yes, I'd love to tell you that story. So it was my first year of college. I was 18. I moved to New York City and had this really a powerful experience. I was in my dorm room and my friend knocked on the door. He came in and he told me the story of something that had just happened to him. He was on the subway train and he was waiting at the platform and he saw a man walking on the tracks. And he tried to call out to the man, tried to help him get off the tracks, and eventually he grabbed the man and pulled him out. But as he did that, the train came and swiped the man across the platform. My friend Eric followed this man to the hospital and ended up, the man passed away. Eric found out that he was an immigrant from Bangladesh and was sending money home to his family. So Eric knocked on my door that evening because he had just started a foundation to raise money to send back to this man's family. And I said, all right, here we go. I'm going to help you. I'm going to raise money for you. I emailed everyone I knew, my whole family, all my friends. I went door to door. I made about $30 that night. And I was so disappointed in myself and my family. And I thought, this isn't enough. This man died for no reason. Turned out the guy was deaf and he was a train worker. And it just seemed so unjust to me. And what would $30 do? So somewhere in my 18 year old brain, I made this connection that I was actually contributing to unnecessary death three times a day at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I didn't want to do that anymore. So I woke up the next morning. I said, I'm going to be vegetarian, I'm not going to eat meat. I'm going to do it in honor of this guy's life. And that was powerful enough for me to do it for several years. And even though I, I wasn't doing it in a very healthy way, I didn't have any nutrition knowledge. I didn't eat meat. And um, it was such a powerful experience. I knew exactly why I was doing it. And every time I was confronted in a situation where there was meat, I knew exactly why I was abstaining from that. That's an awesome story. And yeah, it's just such a, a powerful, like you say, an unusual way to make a connection. You know, we love hearing yeah. everybody's stories. Everyone's so different and so diverse. And, and yeah, really, you know, that was awesome. Even back then you wanted to achieve big things and yeah, really help people. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I heard later on that, you know, you're one of the many people like myself, um, who were told by the doctors in the end that you had to start eating meat again, um, for health reasons. And uh, I had the exact same scenario. I was vegetarian, um, and I was running, I was, I was training for long distance running. And my doctor told me that I had to start eating meat again for calcium for my strong bones, because, you know, <laughs> if I wanted any hope of, of reaching my goals, I had to start eating meat for calcium of all things. So, um, so I did as I was told. Um, what about you? Was it a case of the protein myth or iron or, you know, what was his reason, his or her? Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. So I had gone back to home to my doctor after three years of being vegetarian and like I said, I was eating fried Chinese takeout tofu every night and drinking beer like every other college student and eating pizza and not knowing what I was doing. 
didn't know how to cook, didn't know how to take care of myself. I gained about 30 or 40 pounds. And my doctor said, oh my God, what happened? This is all because you're vegetarian. And I said, really? I, I didn't know that. Okay, what do I do? You have to start eating meat. Just start eating fish and chicken at least. You'll lose weight. So for me, it was about losing weight. Uh, I had high cholesterol, probably from the beer and cheese and not from anything else. Uh, so it's so funny that they would tell me to eat meat because of high cholesterol. Wow. So anyway, I, I listened because I didn't know any better and I was confused and my family was concerned. And I said, okay, I'm going to incorporate some things back into my diet and did that for a short time. And until I came back to myself and realized there were healthy ways to be vegan and vegetarian at the time. Oh, wow. That's the, that's the thing, you know, it's, um, <laughs> changing one unhealthy diet for another, you know, because the doctor says so. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it's bizarre we don't pick up on these things, but, you know, it is as it is. Um, so it wasn't until you went on holiday to Aruba with your grandparents, and that's where you met your, your wonderful husband, Andre. And he's actually the man we have to thank for getting you on here because he dobbed you in. And um, I got to say, when Jackie said, you know, um, about the work that you've done in Aruba, I was like, is, is that the Kokomo song? Is that is that where it's from? <laughs> like, yeah, we got Aruba, Jeremy. <laughs> but, um, yeah, up until then, um, yeah, we'd never really heard of the place. And can you just confirm for us, because I did terrible in geography in school, Aruba, that's part of the Caribbean Isles, is it? Yeah, you're pretty far away, so I wouldn't expect you to be familiar with Aruba. It's a, it's a very famous uh, tourist destination, mostly for Americans in the Northeast. It's right off the coast of Venezuela, and it's part of the what's called ABC Islands, so Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao, and it's part of the Dutch Kingdom. So they speak Dutch there, they speak Papiamento, which is their local language, and they also have Spanish influence, and of course they speak English as well. It's a very tourism-oriented island. Oh, wonderful. It sounds a beautiful place, definitely. And, um, you it's know, magical. it sounds it. And, um, yeah, we'll have to put it on our travel wish list, especially now, you know, hearing so much about it. But, um, yeah, I mean, Andre said straight away, you know, you have to talk to my wife. She turned the whole island of Aruba vegan. So we're like, wow, you know. But um, before we get to um, how you turned Aruba into a vegan paradise, we have to go back a little way to um, when you and Andre first got together and the two of you went to live in the Netherlands for a while. And um, it was during your time here that your love affair with food really sort of started and, and ultimately led you to becoming vegan. Um, it sounded, you know, like a wonderful time in your life. And uh, it must have been really exciting for a young woman like yourself. And uh, it's a great story. So uh, would you mind telling us about that time? Sure. I was 21 when I met him. Now I'm 34. He was 19. And I met him when I was on vacation with my grandparents, like you said, not expecting anything to come of it. And it was just this crazy love story. I ended up quitting my job, my very stable job, to move with him to the Netherlands and started a new life there. I went on a tourist visa, had no agenda, nothing to do. Because of that, I had a lot of time to spend in taking care of myself. And I learned how to cook. I taught myself how to cook. Uh, I would look up food blogs and I basically went through every recipe on food, this food blog, Oh She Glows, which is one of those old school kind of vegan blogs. I went through every recipe, learned how to cook everything she knew how to do. And that's really what changed my life is learning to cook. So in the Netherlands really was my first time interacting with farms. I had grown up in New York City. And like you mentioned, with a family of butchers, my grandfather worked at the butcher shop. I would go after school to visit him and see him in the kitchen covered in blood with his white apron and hug him and not really think much of it. And in the Netherlands, I could see the cows grazing in the grass at the farm. And I could actually go to the vegetable farms and pick my own vegetables. And I understood the difference between organic and not organic. And it was really my time to own my own health because I had been through this period where I was vegetarian, then I wasn't, and wasn't, I was really confused about how I wanted to eat. So during that time, I reconnected with the diet that I wanted to, to really uh, make my own. And through that, I read Eat to Live by Joel Furman and some other books. And we started to watch documentaries together, Cowspiracy and Food Inc. and those documentaries about the food system. And we decided together to change our diets. So during that time, we became vegetarian together. We, um, we eliminated artificial sweeteners, artificial colors and things like that from our diet as well. And really started to eat more whole foods plant-based. We weren't quite vegan yet, but we were, we were on our journey. I like to say that's when my journey really started. 
And um, then we ended up moving in with a vegetarian family because I became an au pair in order to stay in the country. I needed a, a visa. So I became an au pair and we both ended up moving in with this family who was uh, parents and three kids. And I had to cook for everyone and they were vegetarian. So I learned again how to cook for this whole family with plant-based stews and everything. And um, then a few years later, we moved back to New York together and found out that Andre was lactose intolerant, just like you know most people are, but I didn't know that at the time. And that's when we started to research veganism and how do we eliminate all dairy from our diet and what does that diet look like? And that's when, of course, when you start to look into plant-based recipes and veganism, you start to see the things about the animals that you didn't know about before. The cruelty that I knew in my mind, but had never really seen it with my own eyes. And that's when we started our, our true vegan journey in only having vegan products in our home and realizing we didn't want to participate in the system of cruelty. Oh, wow. It's a, such a wonderful story. And yeah, um, you later went on to go back to Aruba then, um, Andre's home country. And after having all that wonderful fresh produce of the Netherlands, um, it must have been so hard trying to find good stuff to eat there because I, from what I understand, it's a bit of a, um, bit of a food desert there. Um, can you tell us about some of those sort of early offerings you had there from as so-called vegan options from the, from the restaurants and such? Yeah, so it's funny you mentioned the word desert. It's not really a food desert, it's an actual desert. And people think of Aruba as this tropical Caribbean island, but it's not, it has a desert-like climate. You see cacti everywhere you go. And yeah, so being in the Netherlands and then living in New York for six years, and I used to work at the farmer's market. I worked as a social worker for a hospital-based nutrition program. I was teaching cooking classes and uh, we had everything we wanted. We, we got to go to Whole Foods and then getting to Aruba, I think that was the culture shock uh, for us was the food, the difference in food. And Aruba has this challenge of being a desert like island where local agriculture is challenging. It's not heavily funded, which hopefully in the future it will be. And I think the government can fund it better so that they can have more local stability and sustainable produce there. It's starting, but when we first got there, it hadn't really started yet. So everything is imported. So when you get imported food, it's lesser quality because it's been in transport for so long. And we, we only had access to what was there. So for example, when I would go to the supermarket, there were no vegan cheeses, vegan meats. There was only tofu. Tofu and beans was pretty much the only vegan proteins that were available to us um, coming from New York where we had everything, where we could go out to eat and order a vegan pizza. And when I would go out to eat at restaurants, my first couple months in Aruba, I would get pasta with vegetables every single place I went to. Whether it was a, you know, Italian restaurant or not, they were still giving me pasta with vegetables. And I ended up in the first few months not eating out anymore because it was such an unpleasant experience paying so much money for things that I could have cooked better at home. So of course, we're always faced with these moments in our life where we can complain about it or we can actually do something about it. And for me, I'm lucky enough to have been able to do something about it and make a change. That's awesome. Yeah, it sounds very familiar to us. Um, interesting, you know, just being in New Zealand, we had the North and the South Island. And um, we, when we first went vegan, we lived at the bottom of the South Island. And, you know, even in, in our country, the, the food system, it trickles down, you know, the other parts of the country get the best stuff. So when we went vegan, it was literally, yeah, tofu was about as sophisticated as it got. But um, one thing that... Uh, comes up recurrently in our in our activist series is the importance of identifying your why um you know your reason for being vegan setting your boundaries and being clear about your values and um what was your experience you know in doing this and how did it help you pave the way for for getting vegan options you know better on the island for yourself and for everybody that's such a great question and it's also something i encourage people to do is find their why because as you've heard i've had many whys throughout my journey but I think there, there comes to a point where there's this ultimate why that really makes you commit and set those boundaries. And for me, once I found that, it changed everything for me. It allowed me to live my life with ease. I didn't have to make decisions anymore about my food. I just knew exactly the way I wanted to eat. So that really didn't happen for me until I got to Aruba. In New York, we were able to get away with not really asking questions at restaurants. If something was labeled vegan or something kind of seemed vegan, we would order it not worry about it. We wouldn't buy non-vegan products, but when we were out to eat, 
it wasn't such a big deal. We weren't uh, super vegans like I say I am today, where I ask 100 questions and, and annoy the waiters all the time. So when I got to Aruba, we weren't able to get away with that because if I wanted to order a pasta, it would by default come with cheese unless I started asking questions. Is it cooked in butter? Is the pasta made with eggs? Is the marinara sauce made with chicken broth? Which you'd be surprised many restaurants do that. You have to ask. So I couldn't get away with anything and I had to be an advocate, which meant I had to learn more than I knew. I had to learn how to read ingredients labels like an expert. I had to learn what are the common things that people put into food when you're, you're not expecting it. And I also had to learn how to communicate with people that were, were challenging for me to communicate. For example, like my in-laws, who I didn't know very well and moved to, to be with close to them. My husband's born and raised in Aruba. And there's a culture there of eating fish. It's an island. So, of course, I didn't want to ostracize myself from the family. And the first couple of weeks we were there, they assumed we ate fish because that's what vegetarian means in the Caribbean. So they put fish on the table thinking they made something special for us. And we didn't know what to do. Put it on our plate, pick around with it. It was it was hard. And we would always leave feeling guilty, like we didn't express ourselves properly. And it wasn't until um, we were really able to decide, okay, we're not going to worry about everyone else's feelings anymore. We're going to let them be responsible for their feelings. We're going to do what feels right to us and they can accept us or not. And part of that really came when we made the connection between myself breastfeeding our daughter and what the mother cows go through. Our daughter was eight months old when we moved to Aruba. I was breastfeeding. It was a hard journey for me personally and I worked really hard to get that breastfeeding relationship going. I knew how hard it was and I remember one day in Aruba, our early days there, I was reading a blog on how to make sesame milk. It was like a new plant-based milk. And I was like, this is so great. But the blog author, I, I don't remember who it was, but she wrote within her recipe, by the way, here's what happens to dairy cows. And there's, this is why you should have sesame milk instead. And yeah, I hadn't eaten milk in years. I hadn't drank milk in years or eaten dairy in years. But I still hadn't made that intense emotional connection between what I was doing to feed my child and what the cows would love to be doing for their children. And once that connection was made, there really was no going back. We decided to completely commit to being experts on the vegan lifestyle, on vegan nutrition, so that we really could live our boundaries and be able to respond when someone had a question, be able to feel confident in, in saying, don't worry, our daughter's gonna be fine. We're raising her as vegan and we know how to keep her healthy. Well, that's wonderful. We did a previous interview with um, the wonderful vegan psychologist, um, Claire Mann, and she said about uh, when it comes to these sort of situations, you know, people people choose to be insulted, you know, or they choose to be hurt by our actions, you know, it's not actually what we're doing. And you know, good on you for just, just mm. you know, sticking with it, sticking with that why. And well, what we would say is the right path, you know. Um, but one thing that we really love about your story is how rather than what most of us would do, you know, when we go to the restaurant, we have a bad meal, we, we whinge and we, we, we throw our hands up in the air, we sort of have a bit of moan, even if we don't say it to the, direct, uh, to the waiters and stuff like that, we moan to each other about the bad meal, but you went mm -hmm. out of your way then to sort of help educate these people and help um, really applaud them when they did something well and, well, what led to Aruba becoming so vegan friendly. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how how you'd approach the the chefs or maybe the wait staff there in a positive way to try and um, try and nudge them in the right direction with the food? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I know that the first response is always to complain or we feel disappointed, we feel let down, we spent our money, we didn't get what we expected, and we feel like it would have been so easy for them to just cater to us, and yet they didn't, and they should be blamed for that, and they should be held accountable for that. So I completely understand why that's the first reaction, and I had those reactions too. But I realized very quickly that that kind of reaction wasn't going to get me a better meal. And when we're in the business of wanting to make a vegan world, or at least for my part, is starting with making a vegan-friendly world, we have to do what's effective. Okay, we have to focus on the most effective strategies. We can't just do what our first reaction is. And my mindfulness training, honestly, is what helped me the most in learning how to be mindful to respond to situations rather than react. And that's part of what I teach in my programs today is that social work mindfulness training and really being focused on responding rather than reacting. So more practically, if you are going to go eat at a restaurant and you wouldn't believe how many people tell me they're, they're vegan and they haven't eaten at a mainstream restaurant in years. And so they go on vacation and this is their first experience in a long time. 
eating at a place that doesn't have solid vegan options. So they just wouldn't know what to do. So I recommend calling the restaurant in advance. If you have that opportunity, make a reservation, call a day or two before you're going to show up and ask to speak with the chef. Now, if the chef is not available, don't give up. Just say, I'm going to leave my number. Please have the chef call me back today. If they don't call you back, call them back. The chef has to talk to you. You're going to get very little done if you're not speaking to the person that's actually cooking your meal. Because if there's a restaurant that doesn't have vegan options on the menu, they probably don't have vegan food in the back in their kitchen. So they're only going to be able to work with what they have. But the chef has that power to be able to go out to a supermarket that day and buy something special for you if they know you're coming in advance. So I did this many times. I would call the chef. I would speak to the chef. I would be very friendly. And I would ask directly, what are you going to serve me? Oh, don't worry. I'll make something. I'll I have vegetables. I'll figure it out. We are good at serving vegans. And I would say, no, really, I I'd love to hear what you're planning because just like any other customer, I'd like to know what to expect. You know, I can't order off of a menu like a traditional customer, but I would still love to hear what you're planning. So then they would say, well, we have a grill. We're going to grill some vegetables. We have a chimichurri sauce we'll put on top. So then you could stop there and you know you're going to be disappointed or you can speak up for yourself, which I recommend. So I would say, could you go to the supermarket and buy tofu and put that on the grill too? And they would say, oh, I guess so. I have to go to the supermarket. Yeah, well, I'd like to be full because I need some protein. What proteins do you have? So having that kind of a conversation with the chef does a couple of things. Number one, it builds your relationship with that chef so that that is the beginning of your journey with that chef. Think of it as the beginning of your activism journey with that person. So it's not the end. You're showing them a positive experience with a vegan customer, someone who's not complaining but is challenging them to be creative and make sure you're satisfied because you want to give them a good review. You want to have a good experience. And chefs that want to serve their customers, most of them do. Most service staff and chefs want to make their customers happy. They will respond well to that. If they don't respond well, it's probably not a restaurant you want to go to. So just hang up the phone and try another restaurant. So what will happen then is you show up at that restaurant and you enjoy your meal and then continue that relationship. So ask to speak to the chef after you eat. The chef will come out. You can ask to take a picture with that chef. Okay, so you can post that picture on social media and you can type, hey, this was so great. I had my first vegan meal at this place that doesn't have any vegan options in their menu. Comment below if you want to see more vegan options at this restaurant. Then you get all your friends to comment, hey, we'd love to eat here if you put this food on your permanent menu. More people go back to this restaurant requesting the dish you had because they saw that it was possible to eat it there. So that's just one of the, the many strategies that I had uh, that had used in the beginning. And it was really about relationship building. And again, that's something I learned in my social work training, relationship building and being positive and encouraging and expecting the best from people, giving people the benefit of the doubt. If a chef or a server comes over and says, how was your meal and it wasn't good, don't lie, be honest. Because the second we lie, we set them up to think, oh, well, I did, I did enough, that's fine. And so many people just, they don't wanna have any confrontation. So they'll say, sure, those grilled vegetables were great, thank you so much, and never return. So we need to show restaurants that there's a demand for vegan food, meaning we have to have honest conversations with them. So what I teach in my program now, I teach vegans how to do what I did all over the world, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later, but what I teach is to how to have these honest conversations with chefs. So if someone asks you, how was your food and you didn't like it, you can say, well, to be honest, I was expecting, and then tell them what you were expecting. So they understand what the vegan customer would have liked to see. Or to be honest, I don't feel full. I, I love the tofu. You seasoned it amazingly, but it wasn't a big enough portion. And when you're vegan, you have to eat larger portions because it's plant-based. So educating, use that opportunity to educate rather than complain. And yes, of course, you know, it sucks to have to pay for something that wasn't amazing. But if we want to be activists, we have to put ourselves out of our comfort zone sometimes and allow ourselves to be uncomfortable for the greater good. Well, what a, what a fantastic response. And hopefully that teaches um, our viewers as much as it's taught me, because I, I'm a, a really bad one for that. I say, oh, yeah, thank you. That was lovely. Thanks. That was lovely. Nice. And then <laughs> as we're walking down the street, I'm giving the, the, the five star critic <laughs> Big old You'll never slam. Go back. Yeah, it makes me think of every good and bad meal we've ever had and, and how we could have responded differently. So yeah, brilliant, really helpful. Yes.
So um, from what we understand, um, you know, what you've sort of alluded to there with, with you know, taking the photos with the chef and, and, and having those reviews and, and making it public, you know, um, Instagram proved a, a key component in giving that positive feedback and helping these businesses because, I mean, that's what you're doing. You're really helping them and in particular helping the chef as well. So um, Instagram is a really powerful tool, which many of us don't understand, um, including me, <laughs> and know how to use well. I'm kind of like, here's my dinner. Um, but, you know... <laughs> Yeah, the same 20 followers, you know, it's, uh, but how, how do, you, do you use it to create that awareness? Yeah. Well, I started with a really good name. So my Instagram handle was called, is called Vegan Aruba. And that was my first account. And I really wasn't into social media before I moved to Aruba, but I recognized that it would be a great place to, uh, you know, I could either be a lonely vegan eating pasta primavera everywhere I went, or I could find out if there were other people on the island coming to the island as tourists or locals that also wanted better vegan options and wanted to live a vegan lifestyle. So I started my account. It was called Vegan Aruba, which was a very simple way to attract people to find me because whenever someone was visiting Aruba, they would Google or look on Instagram, vegan options in Aruba, and they would find me and contact me. So starting with a good name that's very direct and clear on what your goal is, is my recommendation. And then I, I used it as a networking tool to connect with people over a very clear message. So my original message was to prove that it was possible to be vegan on Aruba. That everywhere I went and I told people I was vegan, they would say, how could you do that? There's no vegan food here. How could you be vegan? It's impossible. I want to be vegan, but I tried that. It didn't work. So I thought, let me prove that it is possible. So just like you said, I would start posting my meals. I would post my meals that I had at restaurants and tag the chef. I would post my meals that I cooked at home. I would post things I found at the supermarket that were vegan friendly that weren't labeled and people didn't know. So I formed a community around education and I would educate people on how to be vegan in Aruba. And then my mission broadened to not just proving that it's possible, but actually making it so. So my mission was to make veganism both accessible and acceptable on Aruba. So accessible meaning that wherever you go, you can find vegan options, whether it's at a restaurant or a supermarket. And acceptable, meaning that when you say you're vegan, someone doesn't look at you and say, what's that? They say, oh, that's so cool. I want to go vegan too, or I'm vegan too, or I know someone who's vegan too. And that's exactly what Aruba is now. Aruba was just recognized as the most vegan-friendly island in the Caribbean by Happy Cow. They have the most vegan-friendly options per capita. So everywhere, everywhere I go in Aruba, it's, uh, oh, you're the vegan lady. I'm vegan now. I, I want to be vegan. That's you know, you, you can try to change people or you can try to change the culture and the environment to make it easy for people to go vegan. And I think a lot of activists really focus on targeting people, whereas my focus became targeting a more macro level change of a culture so that people can then make their own decisions to go vegan because it just makes sense. It's, it's available to them. And my, my goal was always to say to people, well, look, I have already proved it's possible to be vegan here. We have great vegan options and you want to be vegan. So if we can be vegan here, why wouldn't we be? There's no more excuses. And when it becomes such a positive, fun thing and restaurants are launching new menus and you know, there's so much coolness around being vegan in Aruba that it just made it easy for people to make that choice. So I don't even know if I answered your original question. What was your original question? I feel like I went on a tangent. Oh, no, no. Just about how you, how you used Instagram to, uh, you know, to create awareness. And, um, and yeah, 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 no, definitely. I, I love that answer. Yeah. I do want to ask one thing, though, um, in relation to the Instagram thing. Um, hashtags are, like, such an important thing on Insta, it seems. Um, I just start typing in random words and putting a hashtag in front of it. Is there any way that you find like the ones to work best or like any, any way you go to to find the best hashtags? Yeah. yeah. So in Aruba, I started using the hashtag vegan Aruba, which was a great way to build community. And I thought of it as my community. So whenever I hashtag vegan Aruba, I would use it as essentially a filter to find other people who were using that hashtag so we could form a community. And so I would encourage people if they found something vegan on the island to use the hashtag vegan Aruba when they posted it. That way I could find it easily and repost what they posted. And then I would encourage restaurants to use that hashtag and they started using it. And then I would comment on restaurants posts and say, uh, I mean, I went to on every restaurant that I could find on Instagram and would write on their posts. Hey, do you have a vegan option? Hey, do you have a vegan version of this? Oh, you have, you have ice cream. Is there a vegan flavor? every single restaurant I could find, I would comment on. And 
I tell you that this works. I built a whole training program around it. It works because no one wants to be left out. If they know that other restaurants have vegan options, they want to have them too. Eventually, I would get so many people finding me and messaging me asking, where should I eat? I'm coming to Aruba. I want to know where to eat. Where do I find the vegan food? That I ended up starting a website called veganaruba.com so that I could have a restaurant directory of vegan friendly places. So I didn't have to type to every single person where they should go and eat. And um, that was also an activism strategy because once I had a website, I could say to restaurants when I reached out to them, hey, I can list you on my website for free and promote you. I mean, it was, I didn't make money from it. I just made a free website listing and said, I'll list you on this website and you'll get customers. So in order to get on the website, you need to have at least one clearly labeled vegan option. And to be in the top tier, you need a vegan menu. And that was an incentive for restaurants to think, oh, hmm, I could get some extra promotion if I do this thing that's going to attract more guests. Awesome. I, I love how it's it's just so positive, you know. It, it's just creating just yeah. such a good buzz around being vegan. Um, and, you know, you said that Aruba's motto is one happy island, which is just a wonderful yeah. motto. Um, and it's a very tourist focus place, obviously, um, and somewhere that the islanders take great pride in making their visitors happy. Wouldn't it be great if everywhere was like that? That would be awesome, you know, That's, we really need to get on board with this. But um, it was this pride and sort of willingness to please, which led you from being a stay-at-home mum that you planned to be with your daughter mm -hmm. um, to actually launching your own consulting business. Um, it sounds like it was a real whirlwind from the moment that you arrived in Aruba, really. So um, can you tell us about that, how it all, yeah, got going? Yes. When I moved to Aruba in 2016, I thought I was going to be a stay-at-home mom. I had quit my job at the hospital and had an eight-month-old and thought, this is great. My husband can work. I can stay home, drink pina coladas on the beach, and enjoy my life. And of course, you heard how all that started. I was eating out a lot and not finding what to eat and realizing I had this activism within me that I needed, it needed to come out. And I started that community. I ended up uh, in the very beginning, with Inst along with Instagram, I gave uh, workshops at a local yoga studio on how to go vegan. So I had a bunch of people in those. I had 16 people in my first workshop to teach them how to live a vegan life. And I would go to schools and give lectures. I did uh, food demonstrations at local festivals. So I started basically just offering free workshops or, or sometimes paid workshops for anyone that asked. And in the beginning, I was just responding to a need that I saw in the community. People wanted to be healthier, people wanted to learn about veganism, and I was able to provide it, so I offered it to them. Then through the restaurant business, that was never something I thought I would be doing, actually. I have zero culinary uh, training, I'm a social worker, and when I, I was invited to speak at the National Restaurant Association because I was able to tap into my network. I had met all these chefs, I had called them all in advance, I had started these relationships with chefs, and a few months later, I was able to give this lecture at the restaurant associations meeting and there were about 20, 25 restaurant owners and chefs in front of me. And I spoke on the experience of a vegan customer. What is it like to be a vegan at your restaurant? And in my presentation, I showed them pictures of the dishes that they had served me at their actual restaurants. And I showed them, this is what your menu looks like. This is mislabeled. This is not vegan. You have it labeled as vegan. This, this pasta dish looks the same as the other pasta dish I was served at the other restaurant yesterday. And I explained the difference between vegan, vegetarian, and gluten-free because that was a big area of confusion. In any place where veganism hasn't gained popularity yet, there's going to be confusion around dietary requests and allergies. So I explained that. And then I ended my presentation encouraging them to make some changes. I encouraged the restaurants to label their menus clearly so that customers would know what to expect. I encouraged them to add vegan options to their menu. And I assured them that people would buy them even though I didn't really know at the time, but I assured them. I said, in the U.S., veganism has grown 600%, and we know that we have a huge tourist population from the U.S., so of course, we're going to get some of these people here wanting to eat at your restaurant. So of course, it's going to get booming in Aruba very soon. And I think sometimes you have to just speak what you want to happen in order for it to manifest. So don't worry so much about the statistics and the, the reality of things, because sometimes you just don't know. Just say I was saying Aruba's the most vegan-friendly island in the Caribbean before it was, and that's what made it so. So I, I spoke to these restaurant owners, and I didn't really expect anything to come of it. And at the end of my presentation, I had almost every restaurant owner come up to me and give me their card. And one owner said, 
okay, can you help us? We need help. We don't know how to do this. And I said, me? Who? Me? I, I just wanted to tell you to do your job better. I was just encouraging you to make vegan food because you're the restaurateur. And he said, no, no. I mean, we saw your pictures. I showed them some of the food I made at home. We saw your pictures. You know how to make vegan food. We don't. Our chefs have never seen tofu before. So why don't you come and teach us how to do it? So I said, yes. And I could have easily said no. I could have said, nah, I came here to be a stay-at-home mom. I don't have time for this. I, I don't even know how to do this. I could have said that, but I didn't. I said yes. And I showed up at this first restaurant. It was a Cuban restaurant. And I looked over the menu with this uh, restaurant owner. He told me that he was vegetarian himself and couldn't even eat the food at his own restaurant, which blew my mind. It's like, why didn't you just make put vegetarian options on your menu? But it's that kind of mentality that, Restaurant owners just don't know. They think that what is on their menu is what people want to buy. And they don't even know that there's an alternative there. So he didn't even realize that he, he couldn't even eat at his own restaurant. And he was super excited for me to help him so that he could enjoy his own restaurant. So I looked over his menu and now it's what I call a menu evaluation. So <clears throat> now I've worked with many restaurants and I've created templates for menu evaluations. But in the beginning, it was asking questions, telling him from the customer perspective what I saw, what was mislabeled, what I would like to eat at this place. I said, okay, you have ribs. Why don't we use portobello mushrooms to make portobello ribs? And you have uh, other Cuban dishes. We could just replace the pork with tofu because that's all we had at the time was tofu. So I came up with some of these ideas and I said, go for it. You could do this. And he said, no, go to the supermarket, buy the food, come back, teach my chefs how to cook it, and then we'll do it. He said, Okay, so I did. So I went to the supermarket, I bought a bunch of food, came back, worked with these chefs who, who actually didn't speak English and, and I didn't speak their language. So that was an interesting first experience. Uh, I was holding up the tofu, tofu, good, we eat this, and explaining that vegans eat this and they had never seen it before. So I ended up cooking a whole bunch of things and they came out with one of the first vegan menus on the island, whole vegan menu. And they had a line of people out the door waiting to try it. They were so successful with it that I ended up calling all those people that had given me their cards and getting contact, uh, getting people were getting in contact with me saying, I saw your menu at this Cuban restaurant. We want a vegan menu too. And before I knew it, within one year, I had worked with like at least 10 restaurants just in the first year. I, I had to go and register as a business so that I could get paid because I realized that first job, it was a volunteer job. But if I was going to be doing this full time, that was a lot of work and I needed to make it worth my while. So, of course, also I had to pay for all the recipe testing I was doing and all the food I was tasting at home. So I ended up starting a business and I worked with so many restaurants and a couple of hotels as well that um, they were just they're so successful with it that it started to influence the culture of the island that not just vegans were enjoying this food, but everyone was going to try the new vegan options. They would have special events around their new menus when they launched. And I started to work with supermarkets to train their staff as well. So they knew how to find the vegan products. The supermarket would send me the list that they could import from the food from their suppliers. And I would tell them all the different kinds of foods that we needed on the island. Because once I was making menus, I needed foods. I couldn't, you know, I needed to have specialty vegan products. So I learned how to import food to the island and Aruban supermarkets now have vegan cheeses of plenty of different brands and vegan meats and all sorts of things. Now, um, vegan ice creams, just everything you can think of. And that was really because we needed it. We needed it for the restaurants and we wanted to make veganism accessible in Aruba. So it's, it's completely changed the culture there. People go to Aruba specifically for the food. And I have people tell me when they were they were like, oh, I have a timeshare here. I was here three years ago. We couldn't eat anything. And then all of a sudden we came and there's vegan food everywhere. And all the, the managers are telling us how much they love serving vegans. And it's just a complete transformation. It, it was truly an amazing thing to have happen. Totally unexpected. That, that is so incredible. Like, I, I feel like my, my smile is going to split Same. my face. I've so been smiling the whole time. Like, Listen. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would have the frying pan and into the fire, and then you, you're like a snowball in the desert, you know? That, that's just so incredible. Like, um, answer the next two questions I was going to ask, but um, <laughs> it just, that's, that's so incredible. And like hearing it in so much more detail, it must have been, it must be so wonderful for you to get to experience so many different types of cuisine then as well on the island, because I know for us, yeah. Um, we'll go on, I don't know, maybe a few Asian dishes this week and then maybe 
back to the West and stuff and sort of lop around. But that must have been so incredible for you to, um, like, yeah, even even del- uh, delving into Cuban food. Like, um, yeah, I learned a lot. I learned my second menu I did was at a seafood restaurant. So I learned how to make vegan calamari and I made a whole vegan seafood platter and just learned, learned things I never would have learned as far as my own personal growth, my own cooking experience. It's, it was just, it, it not only transformed the island, but it of course changed my life as well. That's so amazing. Um, um, I know earlier we sort of touched on this, like people would just come up to you and say how um, you're, you're the vegan woman, you know, you're, you're the Aruba woman, you know, and um, how, how does it feel for you, you know, being that human dynamo, that, that revolutionary on the island, you know? Yeah, well, so that, that happened a lot. People would grab me in the supermarket and say, you're that vegan lady, you're vegan Aruba. Or they would send me a message on Instagram when I got home and say, I, I think I saw you today, but I was too nervous to say hi. And so that's when I changed my Instagram name to my name, Meredith Marine, and decided to make vegan Aruba its own thing because it did feel strange being a foreigner in this country and being identified as this very Aruban thing that was happening. So as a social worker, I was very conscious from the beginning. I didn't want to come in and uh, colonize the place with my own agenda. And that isn't what happened. I didn't have an agenda when I got there. I was responding to a need, but it was always at the forefront of my mind. How can I do this work in an anti-oppressive way so that I honor the culture and I honor the cuisine and I don't come in with my own needs or my own agenda. And And I feel like they did that well. And I did that by supporting the locals who were vegan already and the locals who had vegan products available. So I always recommend people who do this work that they support local businesses, that they promote them, that they, if they're going to organize a meetup, do a meetup at a local business, locally owned. If you're going to try to put a vegan dessert into your menu, use a local bakery. So I always tried my best to support local businesses whenever possible and also help build the confidence of the local vegans so that they could they could do more with their veganism. They could be active as well. And um, we had James Aspie and Carly Taylor visit us once and we were doing outreach at a local health fair. So instead of me just showing up with them and three foreigners doing health outreach in Aruba, I was able to meet a, a team of um, vegan teenagers and I had corresponded with them through Instagram and I was working on starting a teen vegan teens program and I invited them to come get a training with James and Carly and myself and actually do that outreach with us at the table. So as much as possible involving the local community so that it wasn't about me, it was about the message and the mission and creating the best place for all of us. Um, But Aruba is a very unique place because it is very tourist oriented. So you have two communities that the island is catering to, the local community and the community of tourists, which at times is more in population than the locals themselves. So it is a very interesting place. It's very different than most places in the world. And I think it is because of that, like you said, the, this welcoming, friendly vibe, this one happy island. It is, it is really a, a testament to the island itself and to the people there and the culture of, of why this was really able to take off so quickly. Oh, it's, it's awesome. Like, um, yeah, I want to go to Aruba, but <laughs> um, I just love to, it. <laughs> it sounds amazing. And, you know, we certainly won't be starving things to you. Um, I just wanted to mention your your website um, briefly as well, Vegan Aruba. You know, that was the first thing when, when um, your husband, you know, said, find out about my wife, check out uh, Vegan Aruba. This is a website. This is what she's done. Um, you know, whether you're, you're in Aruba or planning to go to Aruba or wherever you are, I think people can learn a lot from it just in their own locality, what can be done to promote mm-hmm. vegan options and, and help vegans in the area. So um, I love the Vegan Aruba website. It's so bright and friendly um, and you've got so much, you know, in the way of resources on it. What kind of thing can, uh, can people find on the Vegan Aruba website? Yes. So if you're going to Aruba, Definitely check out veganaruba.com before you go because the most valuable thing to you will be the restaurant directory, which is clearly telling you which restaurants are going to be the most vegan friendly on the island. And try them all. They're all amazing. There's such brilliant food in Aruba. I have people from New York tell me that, oh, I go home to New York and I can't get the kind of vegan food I get in Aruba. So I highly recommend you check it out if you're planning a trip. Um, 
if you are not planning to go to Aruba, I recommend that you go to the website and you download my ebook. It's a free ebook and it has some of the recipes that I created for restaurants so you can enjoy this taste of Aruba at home. I also have in that ebook some activism strategies and a longer version of my story than you've heard here today. So veganaruba.com. And I will mention that I'm actually not in Aruba right now. So we left Aruba a couple months ago, right before the pandemic hit. We came to Florida to visit family and to figure out the next step of our journey. My husband just finished his certification program to be an international school teacher. And we don't know where we're going to end up next. So we are, we're not in Aruba right now. We may go back or we may go somewhere else or we might stay here. The world is pretty uncertain right now. Um, but Vegan Aruba itself is a movement that's going to keep going on whether I'm there or not. The website will stay. The social media will stay. And I actually have a team of people that are working now to help me reorganize it so that it can become even more ingrained into the local culture. That's brilliant. Well, hopefully you come to New Zealand next because we really need it out here. So <laughs> He was saying, he said, we've got to get to. here this day. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to, but you know what? I, I would get so many people saying that to me. Like, why don't you come to my place and veganize it? Or, you know, and then that's why I started my training program to help vegans all over the world to do this work in their own communities. Because like I said, I'm not, I didn't go to Aruba with an agenda to do this. And I don't think it is appropriate to just travel around to different communities trying to spread my agenda to help people if I don't even know they have a problem. So I, I like to lift up local influencers and local activists, local community organizers that want to take their activism in a different direction or an additional direction so that they can help the hospitality industry transition into plant-based food service, which is what my company does now. And I'll, I'll tell you guys how you can be part of this. So if you follow me, first of all, and at Meredith Marine at um, on Instagram, you'll, you'll type in my name so they know how to spell it. So that's really the best way to find out information about the programs I offer. My signature program, you can find out at veganhospitality.com. So I started that business about a year ago when I was getting these messages from people who were saying, I need to be able to do this in my community. And I said, oh, I, I better figure out how to make this applicable to other communities. And so I did. So I researched all the things that I did through my method I created working with restaurants and hotels. And I, I put it all down into a training program. And now I have this 12-week live training program that I do with people really in every country in, in all over the world so that they can become vegan hospitality activists and vegan hospitality consultants in their own communities. So since uh, September, I've trained 44 people in, um, I think it's 11 different countries and 15 different U.S. states, and they've all started their own vegan hospitality consulting businesses and are using my community organizing strategies for social media and also in person to work with restaurants and hotels to create a vegan-friendly hospitality sector. Wow, it really is taking us uh, so cool. <laughs> another step closer to that vegan world. We, we've got to make sure we've got one out here in New Zealand. Then. I think so. I think so. Yeah. I don't have one in New Zealand yet. So maybe you guys will be the first, or maybe you know someone. Oh, that, yeah. That we would be need lovely. one. We need one. Yeah, that would be brilliant. <laughs> so, um, what would you say is one of the sort of um, most important skills in being a, in a good influencer? Yeah. Um, to be a good influencer or, or a good activist, I, I always say the number one skill is to have self-confidence. And that's really the, the one thing that people get out of my program. I started the program thinking it was going to be all about the, the tools and the tactics and the strategies and the method. And then I did surveys. I do surveys at the end of my program. And everybody says the number one thing I learned here is to be confident in myself, that I can do this, that I, I'm not a chef, but I can do this. I'm not a, a experienced business owner, but I can do this. Because if we don't have confidence, we don't believe in ourselves and then we're not gonna be able to take action. And action is what we need in order to create a vegan world. So in order to build confidence, it's important to have experiences that show you're gonna be successful with this. So we have to be able to put ourselves out of our comfort zone, move forward through things that are maybe a little bit challenging or different and do them. Like having those conversations with the chefs that you don't wanna have that are awkward, but you have to do that to build confidence and make sure that you know you have those skills to be able to move things forward. So confidence isn't about believing you're going to be the best at something or the most beautiful person in the room. Like we think of confidence, but confidence just means that you believe in your ability to make an impact. You believe in your ability to help people. You believe that your voice matters. And I think that if an activist doesn't have that, then they're not going to be very effective. So uh, I've seen activists that 
they know their voice matters. And that, that takes me, I think, to the next tip that I would give is to have clear messaging to make sure that your message is really clear and simple. And you'll see this with the, the large vegan influencer activists. They have one clear message and they just hit that message home and they just say that message a hundred times in a hundred different ways, but it's the same message. So like you said, figure out your why, figure out your message and stay with that and just keep promoting that message through, through living it and through sharing your life. And the last thing I would say about vegan influencing is to be patient. Like I said, have mindfulness, respond rather than react. So be patient and, and listen more than you talk in the beginning. So have, cultivate your listening skills, whether it's talking to your mother-in-law or whether it's talking to a chef at a restaurant or um, talking to someone who you've never met before. Listen and under, try to understand them as best you can before you start promoting or saying whatever you want to say. Um, I think that a lot of times we stay in our vegan bubbles for so long that we kind of forget how to interact with other people, <laughs> other non-vegans, um, in a non-outreach, direct outreach kind of way. And there are so many vegan influencers that, especially the people that join my program, they say, oh, I, I've never been to a non-vegan restaurant and since I went vegan, or I don't have non-vegan friends. I don't know how to talk to them. And they don't know how, how to navigate these conversations. But we have to put ourselves out of our comfort zone and we have to move toward integrating, being part of the rest of the world so that we can have an influence. We're not going to have an influence if we're only in our core circle and the only time we interact with non-vegans is on a direct outreach conversation on the street. We have to have relationships with non-vegans. We have to put them in a situation where they can like and know us and trust us in order to be influenced by us. So they can't be influenced by us if they have a one time, they can be if they have a one time conversation, but you're much more likely to influence someone with a longer term relationship. So I'd encourage anyone who's listening to just get out of your comfort zone and don't be afraid of getting out of that vegan bubble. Go to a non-vegan restaurant, put yourself in an awkward situation and you'll surprise yourself that you can probably navigate that with ease better than you thought you could. I love that, that's so valuable. And uh, I love what you said uh, before about, um, you know, faking it till you make it, you know, even like, like with the, the telling the, um, you know, the restaurant owners, you know, that veganism has already increased by 600% or whatever, you know, even if you don't know those statistics, act like this is something that's already happening that people really want to be part of. It's, uh, it's awesome. And, um, you know, I love the way you refer to yourself as a hospitality activist. I think that's brilliant. You know, it's one thing that we we wanted to get across in this series that, um, you know, there are all different kinds of activism right across the board. But I have to say, you know, hospitality activism was never something that occurred to me before. And it's just so brilliant, so effective. It's such a great term. Um, and I think a lot of our viewers, you know, could really want to get on board with this um being hospitality activists in their own area out of everything that you've done which i know is so much but um what's your favorite thing about what you do hmm. well my favorite thing from the very beginning was the creative process around uh being strategic and and solving a problem so there was a problem with the menus that i looked at and i got to solve that problem and i got to get creative with the recipes and even though i wasn't a chef it was something I knew was figure outable. I knew that I could do my research. And if no one else on the island could do it, I thought, well, I have to. I have no other choice. So I had to figure it out. I was pushed to figure it out. And, um, and that creativity is what keeps me going. It's what keeps me innovating and creating new programs. Right now, I'm working on a personal development program for vegan activists to help them build confidence and help them um, learn those mindfulness skills so that, you know, people who don't necessarily want to go into hospitality, but still want to learn how to express their voice as an activist. So that's something I'm working on right now. And the creativity is really what has kept me going. Oh, that's so wonderful. Now, I know we've touched on it uh, throughout the, the episode, but um, can we just um, say again, where can viewers uh, follow you to find out more about these fantastic courses, all your wonderful insights and just you're, you're brilliant. Um, where, where can we follow you? You can follow me at Meredith Marine. So that's Meredith, M-A-R-I-N on Instagram. I, I respond to everyone. I love my community there. I, I, I really develop personal relationships with the people who follow me. So it's not a one-sided thing. And looking at my Instagram highlights, the stories there, 
you're going to already get value from just uh, learning from, I have a lot of mini trainings up there. And if you want to learn more about the training program, you can go to veganhospitality.com or just Google vegan hospitality. It'll be the first thing that comes up and you can always reach out to me. You can reach out at Meredith at veganhospitality.com. That's my email address. You'll find me. Just Google it. You'll find me. That's um, awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely do that. And um, with your courses, am I right in thinking you sort of, you have uh, intakes twice a year? Um, am I right in thinking that? Well, I've actually run this program five times in the past year. So I've, this is my fifth round. We're currently uh, almost graduated from the fifth round of the program. And I don't have a date set for the next round. And that's because I am working on this other program. And I also want to give my current students time to take off with their businesses. Cause like I said, this is only a year, less than a year old. And my, my graduates are, you know, they, they still need time to be successful and I want to have more testimonials and make sure I don't create too much competition with having multiple vegan hospitality consultants in the same cities. So I will probably launch the next round in a couple months, but I am always accepting applications. So you can always apply, you just email me, I'll send you the brochure and then we'll do an interview. And then if, you're a good fit for the program, the program's a good fit for you, you'll be invited to, to join the program when the next round comes. That's oh, wow. awesome. I have a feeling someone will be wanting to investigate <laughs> that. <laughs> it's incredible what you've done. And then, you know, all the whole time you've been raising a little vegan as well at the same time. So, um, you know, that's a fantastic form of activism as well. I reckon that must be one of the greatest forms of activism there is being a vegan parent and uh, raising, yeah. you know, the future generations. So, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. She's such a, a little activist herself. And so we see, I mean, we see all the propaganda right in front of us when you raise a, a kid, because you see on TV, the little cartoon characters making banana bread with eggs. And my daughter just tells me, oh, don't worry about that. It's not real. It's just on TV. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> so she helps, she helps me. And she says, she now knows she's four. She knows when she goes out with family or friends, she asks them, they offer her something. And she says, is that vegan? And she knows that that's how she wants to live her life. So it's it's really interesting to raise a vegan child in this current world, and um, and to just be so hopeful about the future for her. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so so much for all your insights in today's episode, and tell us about all the work that you've done. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. Um, yeah, it's yeah. wonderful to have somebody so positive. You know, everybody that we interview is. is is positive, you know, in what they do and make such a difference. But, you know, it's, it's, you've given no, well, no, actually pun intended. You've given so much food for thought. You know, you've got me questioning every marinara sauce I've ever had in a restaurant <laughs> without checking that it's had chicken broth or something in it. You know, it's I've learned oh. so much. It's, it's brilliant. And um, th yeah, thank you so much for everything that you do. It's fantastic. And please thank Andre for um, telling yeah. us about you and dropping you in. <laughs> we will most I certainly will. follow he's, you. He's my, biggest, he's my biggest fan, my biggest support. Of course, I couldn't have done any of it, any of it without him and um we're such a great team so i'm really i'm lucky i feel so blessed and lucky to be able to do this work and i know you know we, we think of it as oh i'm so positive like sometimes activism can get you down there's burnout yeah all those things happen and um it's easy to be positive when you can see the change happening right in front of you but in order to see the change you have to put yourself out there in situations where you can inspire change and that means having direct conversations with people who are different than you and people that need your help so i've had so many great experiences with chefs and with people that allowed me to see that change is possible and that's really what keeps me going and keeps me staying positive and helps me build this whole network of people that are also really positive about the future so i know the future is plant-based i know the future is vegan i know it's bright and I know that because that's the world I want to raise my daughter in. And so I'm going to make it happen. Thank you for watching this episode. If you would like to support our speaker, then follow the links provided in the description. If you're enjoying this content, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Leave a like on some of our videos and drop some comments with the things that you've been learning from this series. We really appreciate all your love and support. And we can't wait to bring you the next episode. Thank you.